Hello and welcome to the Digitizing Europe Summit, Opportunities for the Next Generation. I'm here today with René James, the President of Intel. Welcome, René. Thank you. Thanks for having me. René, today we talk about the potential of digital technologies for growth, also for future employment. And you, in particular, um, look at big data in the contents, context of that conference. Yeah. Um, why don't you just elaborate a bit on, on that? Do you, do you really think that big data will create jobs? Many people are afraid that they won't. I think, uh, I do think it will create jobs. I think it'll transform some jobs. It'll create new jobs. It'll create new ways to do old things. And um, I think it'll give us breakthroughs that, into areas we've never been before. Um, I think there will be a lot of new jobs that will be created around the, the analytics and insights into the data. So what, not the collection of it or the storage of it, but actually what the so what of the data. Mm -hmm. um, we also talked today about where also, you know, uh, software or computers in general need the support of humans because some <laughs> things can also easily be right. replaced. Um, right. What is your take on this? Well, first of all, you know, the, the entire area of cognitive computing or, um, you know, artificial intelligence requires humans to train the machines and to give the base content to the machine. So it doesn't replace humans and certainly um, it's an augmentation of insights and pattern recognition that humans miss, uh, but that the humans need to actually do the, in, the interpretation and the insight management. That's where I think that the real new job opportunities come from. They come from creating new services and or new jobs that are about what you do with that data that comes from you know, the assistance of the machine, if you will. Mm -hmm. Could you give us some kind of more concrete examples of the kind of jobs that might evolve from that development? What, you know, we talk about data analytic or the data analyst and things like this. Well, data analyst sounds super boring, but I think, I think being a, having base software computational skills and or data programming skills allows you to imagine that you could start a company. So on the small scale, it could be a startup. That's job is, you know, we take these massive amounts of big data in the area of medical records or what have you, and we turn it into insights for oncologists or for pediatrics or for, so I think there'll be specialized software services that people will create those, you know, and on the other side of it, there'll be people who work at big hospitals and there's a whole new category of jobs that's called computational scientist mm -hmm. who like a radiologist had to start to learn to be able to use digital film and use computers to look at, look at um, you know, people, people's bones, then there will be an emerging class of computational scientists who sit alongside of the doctor and actually analyze and derive the insights that they say to the doctor, look, we've seen this over you know, this many hundreds of millions of people, and it would tell us the following things, and here's the treatment options you should consider. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like a whole new role. But again, the foundation of all of this is base computing skills. Mm -hmm. Talking about skills, um, you also addressed the, the question of you know, the education, education. we need. Um, where do you really see, what, what, what do you think are the most crucial points here? What, what does education <laughs> have to deliver? I think we have a short-term and a long-term problem. Short term, I think the number one thing we should do is make sure that we have computer science um, curriculum at the university level. Two or three out of six universities on average have computer science curriculum. That's not sufficient. Just basic programming, that just you know, programming 101 so that you just have the basic skill of how you'd even set up and create a program using modern tools, which really isn't that hard these days mm -hmm. because that gives everyone kind of a baseline coming out of their, if you will, undergraduate degree. Longer term, we need to go back to the middle school. I'm speaking in, in US terms. I know it's slightly different and certainly different in Germany, but the middle school and high school um, curriculum, and we have to actually bolster com um, math and science mm -hmm. as well as base compu computer science skills. Mm -hmm. And that's a multi-decade long shift in the training of people. Do you think that also the kind of responsible use and also the responsible generation of data should also be part of that curriculum? I mean, we talked today about, you know, what is an enlightened citizen as well in a I do think responsible society. use is, is actually part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. I think it is really important that we start to set boundaries for people about what's appropriate. 
what's anonymous, what's the appropriate use of anonymous data, which may be significantly different than the appropriate use of personal data. Even if it's opt-in personal data, there still needs to be some appropriateness around the storage of it, who's able to use it in what context. Um, you know, in a medical opt-in regime, you might say, hey, this is, this is gonna help me get better treatment. So of course I'm gonna say yes to very personal data. But it's gonna be used in some boundary, meaning only my doctor and their analyst can look at it. And it can only be used in my treatment, not, you know, and it doesn't become a public record about me and that I might be sick and turned over to, you know, XYZ insurance agency or what have you, right? So I do think that we have to start to train people about how to think about what's personal, what's public, what's anonymous versus what's not. And we talk a lot about the risks of personal data. We're not talking a lot about the opportunity space because there's a lot of opportunity, um, but it requires management. And you know, we're so far away from having any kind of norm, right? Someone gave me an example that I think helps people put their minds around this. Everybody knows in every country in the world, if an ambulance is coming, you pull over everywhere. Happened yesterday and here in Berlin. Everybody moved, my driver, we all moved over because here came an ambulance. That's the norm, right? There's no norm on data. So none of us know. Anonymous data, it's marked anonymous. We all have a norm about how you use anonymous data, right? We're going to have to get to that kind of a global thinking process about categories of data. It's also because so many things are happening in the background, we don't even, as it were, we don't see the ambulance coming because things just happen in our smartphones. You know what I mean? It's very I think that's to... true today. I think we, this is part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. There's challenges for us. This is a whole new world. Mm -hmm. um, we grew up in, uh, you know, in an open internet, open data sharing environment. Social media has been the pinnacle of living your life out loud, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, thinking about the, the peculiar or particular um, sensitivity uh, regarding privacy in, in Europe and particularly in Germany, do you think that is innovation hostile to a certain degree? Do, do you think it's a, bit, it's a bit too much from your perspective? From I, I don't know what too much is because I don't, I don't think we are smart enough to know yet. Mm. What I would say is I found the Chancellor's comments this morning at this conference to be very thoughtful. Mm. And um, so I think it's more the case that um, Germany is being thoughtful and thinking about what the implications are of this changing world. There's no right or wrong. I don't think we have enough information. I think it's really early days. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw a video of Intel where one of your employees talks about his own um, actually cancer treatment. Which, which I was, spoke about this morning. Yes, yeah. and, and it's, it was successful and it's, yeah. it's, a, it's great. Um, and and, and um, you encourage the employees to take part in that scheme and to have the, the genome yes, analyzed. we do. Um, of course, you know, when you think about, for example, uh, health insurance and a system of solidarity where the kind of veil of ignorance, not knowing who might be more likely or less likely to get, get sick, um, you know, is the very basis of a system like this. Don't you think it's also very dangerous if we really know so much about the details of, or the, the probabilities, let's say, of, our, of getting sick or not? Um, it, to be honest, it scares me a bit. Well, this was, we discussed it uh, in our panel today, the dataism, yes. where you get profiled. Yes. Um, I do think profiling is going to be one of the topics mm -hmm. where, which could fall into the category of mismanagement of data, okay. right? It's one thing to profile someone to say to you, you have an 80% greater risk because we know that your, your profile looks like these other people versus hey, th these people who look like this, we should treat it in, in, a, in a differentiated way that's inappropriate because we think they might, which is, you know, dataism, if you will. So I think the discrimination on the basis of personal data is going to become a topic. Mm. It'll be a new category of non-discrimination. Okay. Thank you, Jess. As my last question, um, what would be your, your advice to the young generation? Um, how should they get ready and prepare for their digital future? What I would say is to not be afraid of it. Um, you know, it used to be that programming computers was for computer scientists. That is not the case anymore. It is very, it's been simplified, the tools exist. Um, you know, it's, it's just, don't be afraid of it, embrace it. Embrace the change, be, you know, experiment, take classes, do whatever you need to do to get yourself confident 
with technology. It's here to stay. It's everywhere. It's in your watch. It's in your car. It's you know, you love the phone, guess what? The car has just as much capability, if not more so, than your phone. And so, you know, you're not gonna get away from it, so you should really figure out how to embrace it and shape it in your life. Thank you very much, Renee, for your time. You're welcome, thanks for inviting me.